Our next topic is due process rights in adjudication and rulemaking. We examine the difference between rulemaking and adjudication and the difference between the participation rights the Constitution assigns them. The place to start is in booming Denver, Colorado. Consider this hypothetical. I have a small plot of land on a rural dirt road. My wife and I have retired there and built our dream cabin. Our neighbors are large landowners. Our neighbors petition the county to pave the road. We do not sign because we like the country atmosphere. The county paves the road. We are unhappy, but that turns to outrage when we get a bill from the county assessing us for part of the cost of paving the road. We hear that the county apportioned the cost according to frontage, but we have the same frontage as the King Ranch across the road, but only a tiny fraction of the acreage. Yet we have to pay the same as the King Ranch does, but get nothing like the same benefit. The family that owns King Ranch doesn't even live there, and they are in the process of selling to a developer. Our dream of country life is being killed, and we have to pay for it. The county says that all we can do is appeal in writing. Unfortunately, my wife and I are not letter writers. But surely we have a right to be heard in person before this bill is final, don't we? The case of Londoner versus Denver arose on facts similar to what I have hypothesized. The U.S. Supreme Court applied the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments. Fifth Amendment, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Fourteenth Amendment, which applies to the states, no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Both amendments speak of due process. We are persons who are being deprived of property, but the county says the only process we are due is a written appeal. Is the county in the right? The court in London versus Denver held that we would have a right to be heard before the assessment is final. Due process of law requires that before the tax becomes irrevocably fixed, the taxpayer shall have an opportunity to be heard of which he must have notice either personal by publication or by a law fixing the time and place of the hearing. Advance notice and a hearing. Do we get to state our case or do we only get to listen? The court says due process means that we get to state our case. Here a hearing in its very essence demands the right to support his allegations by oral argument, however brief, and if need be, by proof, however informal. Maybe we win and maybe we lose, but we have to be heard. We feel pretty good about this, but the next thing we know, we get another bill in the mail. We get our property tax bill, and it says that because of the increase in property values countywide, all property is being assessed at a 40% higher rate than last year. That's a heck of a lot more than we paid last year, and it's twice what they're trying to stick us for, for the paving of the road. We hear the Board of Assessors did this in closed session. By golly, we're going to get a hearing on this one, too. Or are we? Seven years after London versus Denver was handed down, the U.S. Supreme Court decided a case a lot like ours. The question is whether, if the state had decreed that the valuation should be 40% higher, the due process objection now urged could prevail. The court says what the Board of County Board of Assessors does is no different from what the state legislature does for due process purposes. 
It appears to us that to put the question is to answer it. Well, what does that mean? To ask it is to answer it. What's the answer? There must be a limit to individual argument in such matters if government is to go on. There has to be a limit to argument. Okay, argument, however brief. We will have told our sad story before so we can be quick. Say what? The Constitution does not require all public acts to be done in town meeting or an assembly of the whole. So we have no due process right on the reassessment, even though it is just as wrong and it's going to cost us twice as much. Looks like the U.S. Supreme Court just reversed itself. Does the court overrule Londoner versus Denver? The court does not think so. In London versus Denver, a relatively small number of persons was concerned who were exceptionally affected upon individual grounds. The court marks differences between the two cases. That decision is far from reaching a general determination dealing only with the principle upon which all the assessments in the county had been laid. The result is that there is no due process right to participate in the setting of a general rule, even though there is a due process right to participate in the application of a general rule to one's own situation. The eminent administrative law scholar Kenneth Culp Davis explained the difference between Londoner and bimetallic in terms of the different kinds of facts before the agency. Adjudicative facts are the facts about the parties and their activities, which usually answer the question of who did what, where, when, how, etc. In Londoner, the facts had to do with the benefit actually received by an individual. These are facts that the individual should have particular access to. Contrastingly, legislative facts do not usually concern the immediate parties, but are general facts which help the tribunal decide questions of law, policy, and discretion. What went into the agency decision in bimetallic were legislative facts, as to which no individual could have had special access. Alternatively, we could distinguish Londoner and bimetallic in terms of the different types of action the agency was taken. In the case of Yesler Terrace versus Cisneros, the U.S. Supreme Court articulated the difference between adjudicating and rulemaking. Adjudications resolve disputes between specific parties in specific cases. Rules affect broad classes of unspecified individuals. Adjudications have an immediate effect on the parties. Rules are prospective and have definitive effect only when later applied. We can see that Londoner versus Denver concerned an adjudication, while bimetallic dealt with a rulemaking. There are elements of each that sometimes overlap, and we could think of these two types of agency action as if they were areas on a spectrum differing only in degree but courts treat them as crucially distinct kinds. For our purposes, our presumption must be that rulemaking and adjudication are polar opposites. The Due Process Clause has implications for agency adjudications, but no application to agency procedures in rulemaking.